The genocides and mass murder which characterized the later modern period often stood in contrast with earlier human civilization. At no period in history had such a large number of organized massacres against peoples of particular ethnic groups been so widespread. The Ottoman Empire had, for the last few centuries, been a sprawling multi-ethnic empire which legitimized itself on the basis of upholding Islamic law across its domains. Despite a clear supremacy of Islam in all domains of imperial governance, it would not cross the mind of the sultans to cleanse their territories of all Christians and Jews. This was due to, and not in spite of, Islamic law, which demanded that Christians and Jews may live under Islamic domain as long as they pay the jizya tax and do not rebel, either verbally or physically. Killing a non-Muslim who is obeying such laws is a major sin described in the hadith or narrations of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Thus, the most orthodox Muslim sultans were diligent in ensuring all of his subjects were not harmed unfairly. With these considerations, it will be completely contrary to reason to assume that a pious leader such as Abdul Hamid II, 34th Sultan of the Ottoman dynasty, would have a particular policy to wipe out the entirety of a particular religious or ethnic group. By the 1890s, the European powers had long been vocally criticizing Abdul Hamid. His alleged treatment of Bulgarian civilians during their rebellion in what is dubbed as the Bulgarian Horrors had given Europe reason to begin a ruthless campaign of propaganda against his rule. The enlightened European powers ignored the state of the Muslims in Bulgaria despite the massacres inflicted on them by the rebels. Only the Bulgarian Christian side of the story, regardless of its authenticity, was spread all over Western Europe. This would be followed by a Russian intervention which ended in Ottoman withdrawal from Bulgaria and brutal ethnic cleansings on the Muslim population. The Ottoman authorities, who were already skeptical of Western notions of impartiality, had their assumptions affirmed once more. In the eastern provinces, the Armenians took inspiration from the actions of their Bulgarian brethren. The Armenian Hunchak party was formed in 1887 by Armenian students from the Russian Empire in Switzerland. It was a Marxist nationalist party inspired by the Russian Narodniks, and likewise believed in the effectiveness of terrorism. The Hunchak party founders had no practical knowledge of life in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, nor, like the Norodniks, awareness of the state of the peasantry. They were privileged students driven by ideology rather than genuine experience. It was these Armenian Hunchaks who would be the main propagators of Armenian independence from the Turks, through force of arms and terror attacks in the coming years. The Armenian historian Ruben Dur Minassian wrote that the Hunchaks strongly believed that by causing antagonism between the Muslim Kurds and Armenians, the European powers would intervene on behalf of Armenia. As mentioned previously, the Armenian revolutionaries were deeply inspired by Balkan Christian revolutionaries of the 19th century, whose central tactics involved invoking European Christian sympathies by massacring Muslim populations in order to instigate reprisals. The European Christians, of course, had no tears to shed over the Muslim civilian deaths and would only spread the news of the bloody reprisals against Christians done by the quote-unquote fanatical Turks. The result would be direct intervention in Ottoman affairs and colonial occupation, as seen in the War of 1876 and the subsequent Berlin Congress. According to Cyrus Hamlin, an American missionary and founder of the Robert College in the Ottoman Empire, a Hunchak revolutionary had explained the organization's plans to him. The Hunchak bands would watch their opportunity to kill the Turks and Kurds, set fire to their villages, and then make their escape to the mountains. The enraged Muslims will then rise and fall upon the defenseless Armenians and slaughter them with such barbarity that Russia will intervene in the name of humanity and Christian civilization. He went on to say, Europe listened to the Bulgarian horrors and made the Bulgarians free. She will listen to our cry when it goes up in the shrieks and blood of millions of women and children. We are desperate. We shall do it. The state of Armenians in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century was much like other ethnic groups. Living side by side with various Kurdish tribes, Armenians in the Sasun region had quite good relations with the so-called Sasunlu tribe of Kurds. They entrusted their properties in times of difficulty to the Sasunlu Kurds and had respect for them 
referring to them as Arras. It was in this region that the Hunchak revolutionaries would begin the violence that would lead to what is now called the Hamidiyya massacres. It should be noted that even during the troubles in Sasun, the Armenians of the region continued to trust and seek the protection of their Sasun Mu'aghaz. The main threat to the Armenians of Sasun would not come from the Sultan, nor Kurdish tribes as a whole, but from a rivaling Kurdish tribe known as the Bekranlu. Indeed, the Bekranlu and many other nomadic Kurdish tribes in the east had proved to be the biggest problem for the Ottoman state when it came to controlling the area. The Ottoman state under Abdul Hamid had in fact sent contingents of soldiers every year to the region in order to protect the settled Kurds and Armenians from the Bikranla Kurdish tribesmen. By 1894, the Hunchaks had converted a number of Armenian bandit warlords to their cause, who began looting the region and executing Turkish tax collectors and gendarmerie. Like revolutions by other Christian ethnic groups in the empire, bandits and brigands would serve as the earliest forms of armed rebellion. Despite the Hunchak influences, the Armenians of Sassoon were actually seen as nothing more than a tool for the greater cause by the party. The party knew that the Armenians would be at severe disadvantage if armed conflict broke out and would sustain the most casualties. This was seen as a necessary evil. To the Sultan, these actions were nothing short of treason and soldiers were sent to maintain order in Sassoon. In the ensuing battles, civilians would flee their villages long before the Ottoman army arrived, and the Turks would not pursue them. There was no order from the Sultan to kill civilians. After the armed rebellion was defeated, Zeki Pasha would be sent to the Sassoon with an imperial decree pardoning the imprisoned rebel leaders and returning the Armenians both their lands and properties. The Armenians returned to Sassoon and would continue living there for the remainder of Abdul Hamid's rule. Following the events at Sassoon, the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire experienced a wave of intercommunal warfare. These bouts of violence were equally misrepresented in European media, and their numbers were blown out of proportion. However, it was clear that the number of Christians killed exceeded the number of Muslims. This was to be expected, as the Kurdish tribes who condu conducted most of the raids had an upper hand militarily. As mentioned previously, this was exactly what the Hunchak revolutionaries intended, instigating Armenian revolutionaries to begin attacks on Muslims and then watching Europe call for an intervention as bloody reprisals ensued was a fundamental part of the Hunchak plan for independence. In the city of Mardin, in the Diyarbakir province, seeing the tension growing between the Muslim and Armenian communities, the Sultan's governor, Mehmed Anis Pasha, decreed that there should be no attacks on Armenian civilians on the basis that Islam forbade murdering of Dhimmis. However, things would fall outside of his hands after a shooting taking place outside of the Grand Mosque of Diyarbakir while Muslims were praying. This would lead to a bout of violence aggravated by Kurdish tribes, according to the French vice consul, who murdered both Christians and Muslims alike. After three days of looting, the governor was finally able to establish order and decreed that anyone caught using a weapon would receive severe punishment. In Turabdin, another city in Diyarbakir, the Ottoman governor ordered the protection of the Christian population from unruly tribes. Where the governor could extend his authority, no Christian or Muslim was harmed. Indeed, wherever Abdul Hamid's authority was strongest, the least number of civilians suffered. There was no evidence of any civilian massacres ordered by the Sultan, rather the complete opposite was true. The massacres were instigated by Armenian revolutionaries and carried out, mostly, by unruly Kurdish tribes. This was not the story that the European press wanted to portray. Based on the statements of local missionaries, who were permitted by the Turkish government to set up universities for local co-religionists, tales of brutal massacres against civilians done on the orders of the Sultan were reported. Some went far enough to claim that the Sultan had issued a decree demanding the forced conversion of all Armenians in the empire. Many proclaimed that the Hamidiyya cavalry regiments named after Abdul Hamid were involved in the conflict despite the fact that the Hamidiyya were never in the area of the Troubles. Others alleged that the city of Harput had been burnt to the ground with the entire civilian population slaughtered. According to the missionary H. H. Van Meter, the persecution of the Armenians by Abdul Hamid was so severe that 20 million Armenians had been murdered over the years. Not a single one of these reports had any validity to them and were later proven false. The missionaries were never concerned about the stories of the native Turks and Kurds, despite their presence in every instance of conflict.
nor was any heed paid to the Ottoman officials or army. Instead, they relied on testimony of Armenians, many of whom were either connected to the Hunchak party and thus had an agenda, or were not even present at the site of the troubles. George Pollard Devi, British vice consul at Van, asserted multiple times that the reports on Armenians being attacked by authorities in newspapers, such as the Daily News, were unfound, and in fact, the Armenians had been the initial aggressors. According to a correspondent of the British Reuter Agency, who had traveled across the Ottoman Empire, he noted his extreme frustration at the quality of reports presented by Armenian witnesses, stating, If the detailed facts of the Sassoon massacre are ever established, and they probably never will, they must be established independently of Armenian testimony, or their value may be seriously questioned. In the first place, every Armenian with whom it has been my lot to come in contact seems to be very vague of the idea of accuracy and truth. In the second place, his anxiety to make out a case against the Turk. He is unwilling to publish as fact any grotesque rumor that he may chance to fall over in the street. In the third place, he does not really know what actually occurred in the Sassoon Mountains, but his vanity will not permit him to acknowledge it. And so, to be up with the times and to help along with the cause of his people, he embellishes the rumor that he hears and frequently says he is in secret communication with friends in Mush and Bitlis, who are harboring Sassoon refugees. An Armenian came to me lately and said, 1,700 Armenians have just now been massacred by Turks. His evidence amounted to this. In Erevan, he had heard a man say that another man in Echmedzin had said that 1,700 people had been killed in the Sassoon massacre. What is the patient investigator to do with such people? American ambassador Alexander W. Terrell expressed a remarkably accurate version of the events. According to him, the reports regarding the atrocities in American papers were sensationalized and exaggerated. In 1894, Terrell reported to Washington that he had received no definitive information on the massacres. He added, With absolute knowledge that revolutionary societies composed of native Armenians existed in the principal cities of the United States and Eastern Europe, whose avowed purpose was to goad the Turks to perpetrate atrocities until the Christian powers would intervene and create an autonomous state. I have been cautious, doing my best not to increase the popular excitement by giving too much prominence to mere rumors. He wrote that the Armenian revolutionary organizations had incited trouble among the Armenian population, saying that the English would come to their aid if they were to attack the Turks. The inhabitants believed what they were told, he thought, because of their dense ignorance. He accurately discounted any Ottoman hatred of Christians or action against Armenians on the basis of religious animosity, noting the many Armenians who were in service to the Ottoman state, including men in high positions. He also noted the presence of more than 40 Armenian places of worship in the capital, completely free and undisturbed by the Turks. Terrell also believed that the conditions of the Irish and Russian peasantry in their respective empires was quite comparable to that of the peasant Armenians in the East, not mentioning the other colonial peoples under the colonial empires who had much worse fates. Ironically, he also noted that Protestants had more freedom of religion in the Ottoman Empire than they did in Russia. When it came to the situation in Sassoon, Terrell wrote that there were no accurate reports on the event, and he believed that the ones that did exist were prepared by the Armenians for political purposes. Despite all of this, European agencies continued to obsess over Abdul Hamid and ceaselessly blame him for all of the troubles, on a personal level. The New York Herald wrote, There seems to be evidence that such atrocities will occur until the Armenian population throughout Asia Minor is exterminated. The Philadelphia Press wrote, What the Turks need is a thrashing of unspeakable severity. According to the New York Recorder, the Muslim monster is as insatiable as ever. He's in the wrong century for this kind of business. This last sentence is important to keep in mind. The Philadelphia Records and the New York Advertiser believed that the European empires should invade and destroy the Ottoman Empire of Abdul Hamid as soon as possible. It is time for civilization to rise and crush the Turk. Indeed, the British government, both conservative and liberal, was on the same page as the press. The Prime Minister of Britain, Robert Gascoigne Cecil, famously stated that Islam was capable of the most atrocious perversion and corruption of any religion on the face of the globe. 
Philip Curry, British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, plainly stated his intention to kill the Sultan. He also believed, like the Prime Minister, that if Abdul Hamid did not acquiesce to British plans of reform, that the navy should blockade the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. They knew the deep connection the Sultan had with the cities and intended to use it to their advantage. However, none of these plans came to fruition, and real reforms did not take place under Abdul Hamid's rule. In the year 1897, Sultan Abdul Hamid declared the Armenian question closed. Many who allege the Sultan's personal involvement with the massacres attempt to reimagine the statement as a successful campaign to Islamicize or ethnically cleanse the empire of Armenians. However, reality completely conflicts with this foolish narrative. Out of the millions of Christian Armenians living in the empire, a meager percentage of them were dead after the troubles, even according to the highest legitimate estimates. These Armenians would continue living in peace for the remainder of his rule. A more realistic understanding of his statement is that rebellious actions of Marxist revolutionaries had been put down and the leadership exiled or imprisoned. Unfortunately, the narrative of Abdul Hamid intending to Islamize the empire by cleansing it of its Christians, despite the ahistorical nature of this claim, is found all over the internet today, including popular websites like Wikipedia. Indeed, the very empires who spoke of their own moral superiority and civilizing missions at this time had already begun and were to proceed with large-scale genocides all over their colonial holdings. The Congolese under Belgium, Algerians under France, Libya under Italians, East Africa under Germany, the Caucasus and Turkic territories under Russia, just to name a few. The world would be plunged into unprecedented bloodshed over the coming century at the hands of these so-called enlightened nations.